Hi, thanks for joining me. It's Luke from Rackage Machinery here. This talk will be about the 6090 shovel slew system. The video is predominantly about the configuration of the 6090 slew circuit. So there won't be a lot of detail on how individual components function. Uh, if you're lucky enough to have CAT training, that will be an excellent prerequisite to this. If not, at least some exposure to the smaller model shovels and diggers and their slew circuits. Despite that all, start out with a basic swing circuit and build up to the 6090 circuit just to build that context. Uh, we'll go over some of the problems or I'll give one example of a problem that can arise from this circuit because it's unique to the 6090 and, and different to other models and the most effective way to troubleshoot which requires a blocking valve supply modification. I'll get into the technical detail in just a moment, but before I do, I want to highlight one of the key advantages to this style of system and how it's been set up is that the loss of control due to a component failure is very unlikely with this configuration. There's plenty of redundancy in there whereby the operator can maintain control and either bring the machine to a stop or even continue to operate in some circumstances where a component has actually failed. So we'll start out with the most stripped back version of a closed loop slew circuit seen in the O&K machines. On the left hand bottom corner here we've got our joystick, our CMS or our servo controller and our proportional solenoids. Um, and they're sending the hydraulic signal over to the balance valve over here. And you've got your slew pump here and your swing motor. So a couple of things I want to point out here is that the the 35 bar servo, when the slew balance valve is in the neutral position, it is sending 35 bar to both sides of the slew pump, holding it in the neutral position. So when that actuates, it actually drops away the pressure from one side to bring the pump onto stroke. So if you were to have a gauge on X1 and X2, you would see 35 bar when it's in neutral, and then when you select slew, 35 bar would remain on one side, and then the other side should drop to a tank pressure. Now, provide a demonstration on this system as it's functioning. We're slowing left. Now the operator has moved the joystick, the left-hand joystick to the left. That's sent a signal through the CAN bus to the CMS or the servo controller. And that will proportionally send out a signal to the appropriate proportional valve. And then that will then send the hydraulic signal to the balance valve. So Y1 is being sent uh, the proportional signal and that will move the balance valve to the left so the P port the 35 bar continues to be supplied to the X1 of the uh, swing pump and then the X2 is then drained a tank so that will then move the servo piston across and then the pump will then begin to produce flow out this leg and turn your motor when the load increases and the pressure increases in this leg it will will then balance this valve at a ratio of 16 to 1 so the pressure in this signal line here needs to be 16 times the pressure in that before it will centralize that valve so as your bucket is stalled in the ground or you come up against some some resistance in that slow circuit where the pressure increases the differential in this surface area in this port to that port is 16 times so this pressure here will get to about 350 thereabouts bar to overcome the 22 bar in this side here when it's uh, at full demand Now I'll just expand that system to what you would find in a 60-30 excavator. So the dual engines, uh, left hand pump, slew pump, and then the right hand slew pump. The, the single balance valve is controlling both those pumps. And then there's two motors. Um, the motors are bridged by these crossover lines and separated by a filter. So much the same as what we've just shown, except for the extra motor and extra pump. Um, and the idea of showing you this is to step towards what we have in the 6090, which is essentially this times three, and that'll be on the next slide. Now we've got the 6090 slew circuit. I'll be using this slide throughout the presentation a few times, so I'll just quickly show you what's what. So forward, we'll be pointing to the left on this. Uh, there's six swing pumps in total on the 6090. The left hand swing pumps here at the bottom 
and the right hand swing pumps here at the top rear swing motors front swing motors there and then the balance valves tucked in down here on the bottom right so there's three of those one for each circuit each circuit is indicated by the different colors here so you can see swing pump one is linked all the way across through the two these two left hand motors to swing pump four swing pump two is linked to the mid motors to swing pump five and then swing pump three is the right hand motors front and rear to swing pump six so they're three independent circuits other than the fact that they are joined by the joystick and then the slew ring other than that in terms of control they're the only things that really make it common i've left out the the blocking valve system the flushing uh charge uh, for here that for this for the purpose of this talk um i will talk a little bit about some of those things further on but for the purpose of um understanding the the main configuration uh we're just discussing the um the three different circuits at this stage So we'll go back to the 60-30 slew circuit and I'll show you two different conditions, a system functioning well and then just some parameters around that and then the system with, a, with reduced performance. So first we'll talk about a system that's operating normally. Each pump will put out 470 litres a minute for a total of 940 litres a minute. Each motor will consume 470 litres a minute for a motor speed of 1125 RPM. And that's a system working fine. That's what you like to see. So let's just say now the left hand pump is producing 100 litres a minute less flow. So at 370 litres a minute from, from this pump and then 470 litres a minute from that pump, we'll give a total combined flow of 840 litres a minute. Each motor will consume 420 litres a minute. It'll split the volume, the combined volume of those two pumps. How does it do that? It's simply because the they're both driving a gearbox which is connected to the slew ring, basically. So they have to spin the same speed. So um, they will they will cut that volume directly in half and consume exactly half each. And all you would see there as a symptom on that stolen machine is. A reduced slew performance so uh, in speed basically it would quite possibly make pressure but it would just be slightly slower so let's entertain both of those conditions in the 6090 we've got some gauges on the circuit now six gauges so uh, two gauges for each circuit for one for slew left and the other one for slew right here we are, uh, the condition is slewing at fault speed. Um, so we're, we're up in motion with very little resistance. We're just turning the machine at full speed, full, full joystick actuation. Uh, the three gauges for the left are all showing about 100 bar. And the three gauges on the right are showing 35 bar, so your charge pressure. Um, 35 bar should be your charge, but I've seen some conflicting documentation saying it's 40. Uh, we're just using 35 for argument's sake here. When you're slewing at speed, because there's three different circuits, uh, varying levels of performance among them, you would definitely see different pressures on the left-hand side. It takes very little pressure of the three circuits to turn the machine. I've just used 100 bar as an example. They can vary I mean, up to 50 bar potentially, sometimes higher. The main thing you want to see is all three of those circuits are basically higher than your charge circuit on the other side and that's everything operating as it should so normal slewing and noise uh, and behavior everything's fine that's all good all the pressures for the left hand are higher than the right hand check is the right hand at charge pressure yep slew system good so that's everything op operating perfectly in a perfect world on the 6090 I'll introduce one of the problems that we'd seen many years ago on the RH400 slew circuit and I'll, I'll talk to you just briefly about what made that more complicated was when you read the BCS on the older machines, the BCS2 machines, you only get the, you get three, three pressure sensors, slew circuit one, two and three. The problem is there's actually six different pressures you really want to see there. So the sensors are set up on a RH400 via a shuttle valve on each circuit. 
So one of the problems we'd seen many years ago, and we managed to tolerate it for quite some time before we managed to crack it, it was you would often see one circuit was really high. This is at slewing at full speed, so typically the pressure should be a lot lower. But what we were seeing was quite a high pressure when we were at full speed unloaded. Um, and it would, it, when we looked at the screen, it would look as though slow circuit one is doing all the work and slow circuit two and three are, are lagging, but for some reason still still producing high pressure it would it would groan and make some unusual noises but fortunately the machine could still operate and and we'd have to defer the problem until we could uh, find up a, find a an, an effective way to troubleshoot it in reality this was what was actually happening in the circuit it wasn't until we used six pressure gauges on the test ports that we actually detected that it was the the return leg on slew circuit one that was producing the 360 bar and sometimes higher. So essentially slew circuit two and three were pulling the machine around and slew circuit one was actually dragging and the pressure was increasing on the output side of the motor. And But strangely the machine could still work, still dig, it would groan, it, you could just hear that the slew wasn't right, it would, it would be under high load almost always when it's slewing. But otherwise, it would still operate and, and counter slew as it should. So what would cause your return leg pressure to be higher than your supply pressure on one circuit? Um, it took us quite a bit of work, but we figured out it was the 6060 pump and the 6090 pumps are essentially interchangeable. The same housing, same shaft, but the displacement internally is different. The 6090 is a 250cc pump and the 6060 is a 180cc pump and they're designed to spin opposite directions with poor plating internally etc um, the the telltale that it's a 6060 pump other than the part number is the cumin qmax screws the problem we encountered was in our rotable pool there was little control over who was repairing our pumps and motors and we we're often getting a pump return spec as a 6060 with 6090 labeling on it um, and that that introduced uh, quite a few incidents of, of that particular fault so your part numbers can only be trusted if the pump is brand new or it's from a trusted repairer who you know is flow testing that pump to ensure that it's producing the right amount of displacement and all of these rules are a guide so there was definitely occurrences of pumps with no external indicator um, entering the 6090 uh, slew pump rotable pool and we would still find that they would be uh, spec'd up for a 6060. So yeah, this problem plagued us and that's why we developed our troubleshooting procedure which I'll show you in a few extra slides. That's not the only fault you can see with these systems that, that can have you scratching your head. The the symptoms that you'll often see, um, pump over temp is a common one, grinding and a thumping noise in the slew, which in my experience that was one of the key things that flagged that fault. Um, when you're in single engine operation, the pump drive with, a, with the pump, um, would you would have problems slewing on single engine, but it would slew fine on two engines with just with the, the faint noise, a rattling sound from your balance valves, which sounds like the balance valves are aren't doing what they should. Um, poor slewing power is a typical operator complaint and a lo loud high speed whirring noise. So I'll, I'll, I'll quickly talk about what the causes of that are towards the end. So how does the machine still slew while it's got such a significant problem there? So the thing is you've got the three circuits, two circuits are still overpowering the one the motor on slew circuit one, or the motors rather, become a pump essentially because they're getting dragged around by the slew ring. And then the pump essentially becomes a motor. So the pump actually assists the engine and, 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 and transmits energy back into the PDO, which can then be used for the slew as well. Slew performance is actually still reduced. Um, and there are net losses on all that regeneration of energy there, but um, it, it still slews just fine. It just sounds a bit unusual 
and it's constantly loading up that slew circuit. Your typical approach for troubleshooting a, a fault like this on an O&K would be to shut one engine down and test it and then run the other engine and then test and compare and see what you see with the symptoms. So in this example, we've got the left hand engine running. These X's here are just to indicate your blocking valves. So unlike the 6040 and 6060, the blocking valves are on each motor. There's two blocking valves per motor. So there's 12 in total. There's blocking valves on this side as well. Um, running on the left hand engine, basically it allows flow from this pump to go through that motor and that motor, but blocks it from going back to the engine. There's a problem that you can get with this is that how the blocking supply is configured. I will show you that later. But when you would test this, you see 360 on the return leg and then 180 on, on the supply leg for the other two circuits. Um, you, you're seeing the same symptoms that you're seeing dual engine operation. Now we transfer to the right and everything begins to smooth back out and work fine. Knowing what we know now, you can pretty confidently say that slew pump one has a displacement problem. Unfortunately, when you're testing it, it's very difficult to prove because of that, that much higher pressure you see in this circuit. It then overcomes blocking valves and throws a whole other bunch of symptoms that makes it very, very difficult to troubleshoot. With any effective troubleshooting practices, you really want to find at least two pieces of evidence that point towards the failing component where possible. Simply because you don't want to waste any time replacing a component that isn't failed, essentially. Like one piece of evidence, like the example given, so we run on the left hand engine, we saw the fault, and we run on the right and we saw the fault. There's still a chance that it could have been the balance valve, blocking valves, a motor, a gearbox um, that could be contributing to that fault. We don't, it was only knowing what we know following all of this that we would be more confident that it's the pump that's failed. However, there's many other failure modes you can see on these systems that would require this type of troubleshooting and that's the single circuit method. And this requires a minor machine modification to do, to be able to do it efficiently. And that removes a massive amount of uh, noise and, and interference with what you're troubleshooting at the time. So I'll get into that in a minute. So with dual engine testing, you're testing six swing pumps, six swing motors, three balance valves, 12 blocking valves, and six sill valves. I've only just highlighted the ones that influence control the most there. I might've left a few out, but trying to compare apples with apples here. So that's dual engine testing. You've got a total of 33 components. You shut one engine down, you're only eliminating three components from that. You've still got your six swing motors, three balance valves, 12 blocking valves, six sill valves. The, you're only removing three swing pumps with that method. When you do a single circuit test, you basically cut that by a third. So you're only testing one pump, two swing motors, one balance valves, four blocking valves and two sill valves. So you re reduce that substantially. How do you enable your machine to carry out single circuit testing? So the standard machine, you can't do this test at all. In, you need to do a slight modification to the slew locking supply. So that's this circuit here. So your, these are your blocking pilot valves for your front and over here for your rear. So these, this green hose and green fittings, you need to make a modification to them. It's only drawing from slew circuit two, so the middle motor on front and middle motor on the rear here. And that's what's used to hold the blocking valves shut in these purple lines. So that needs to be modified. I'll go into the detail of that in a few later slides. And then while you're conducting the test, you need four dummy shock relief valves for your swing pumps. And I'll give you a bit more detail on that, but just quickly here, you've got your 400 bar shock relief valves on the underside of each pump. Basically you fit two shock relief valves to the pumps you want to disable that have the spools removed so then they become open center. So we'll just go back to the 6090 slew circuit here. I'll talk about the blocking supply modification. So I'll just strip some components out of it here. So there's your just your main supply lines for your pumps and motors. And now I'll introduce the blocking system to this circuit. 
in the top left we've got the right hand blocking system so for the front motors and the front blocking valves which protect the right hand pumps is the right hand blocking system so that right hand blocking pilot valve is over near them and then the left hand blocking system which is on the rear motors uh, the left hand blocking pilot valve is down beside those rear motors under the walkway and they protect the left hand pumps in this condition we've got both engines running the servo signal coming in for the left here holding the blocking pilot valve against the spring and then this blocking signal or blocking circuit is vented to tank so these blocking valves are free to open no matter what direction the oil comes from to them and same for the right hand side there just focus on the right hand side now we're actually just going to shut that engine down now the blocking pilot valve spring has pushed it back over and all blocking pilot valves are now connected to the mid slew circuit via the shuttle valve so as you're slewing on single engine operation the oil pressure say we're slewing left and it's this leg here oil pressure comes up it will go here through the shuttle valve and then hold the blocking valves closed so as that pressure increases in that slew circuit the force on those blocking valves increases the as you slew right the that will then obviously switch to this side via the shuttle valve the problem you have with that fault we showed earlier slew circuit one being 360 bar whereas uh, slew circuit two and three were only maxed out at 180 the pressure of one of these legs being at 360 bar could potentially force that blocking valve open and actually try and turn those pumps and uh, cause problems and other unusual symptoms while you're testing and that's exactly what we were seeing what I'll do now is I'll, I'll quickly swi switch to the next slide but just pay attention on the blocking supply so this green I'll change it to the blocking supply modification which we're talking about so just look at the right hand side for in this case and here's the blocking supply modification schematic what it looks like when it's installed uh, it looks pretty untidy simply because I've just tried to cram it all into a tight space and the shuttle valves are quite big for the schematic um, in reality it's it's a lot tidier than that I've got a bit of a diagram on what it should look like completed what we had before was the mid circuit or slew circuit 2 the green it was drawing from this point here or this point here for the highest pressure to hold your blocking valves closed now it's drawing from all six circuits for the highest pressure so if you've got one over here that's 360 bar like we talked about before that will then be the one that wins past all these shuttle valves and that's the pressure that gets through to hold your blocking valves in the closed position if it's this one then it will it will be the one to end up at the blocking valve blocking pilot valve via them shuttle valves um, same for the left hand side uh, conducting machine modifications it's not something I take very lightly we we rigorously assess the risk associated with that and I always uh, encourage to follow your site procedures around mod 2 equipment so here's a bit of a diagram unfortunately I didn't have a photo of this um, but this diagram explains it pretty well is that we got a bird's eye view of the six swing motors here for the purpose of this modification and this is what it looks like standard so you've got your blocking right hand blocking pilot valve at the front motors and then the left hand at the rear and it's this green t-piece is the shuttle valve and then there's these rigid fittings between them to connect it all on the back side of the blocking valves on the middle motors it's just the one hose that goes out to your blocking pilot valve um, I've left out the lines or like the purple galleries from the previous schematics that go to the top of all six of these they don't they don't change at all um, what is tapped into this circuit is these yellow lines each motor every motor has at least one of these lines that goes back to your balance valves on your x5 or x6 um, ports for your high pressure signaling so just pay attention as I switch to the next slide and this is what it will look like with the modification installed so we've just got the middle ones set up there and now we just add the modification to this configuration here and essentially all we've done is add a 
the, these fittings and shuttle valve to each motor. Um, two motors will have an extra shuttle valve on the back of it and that will allow the highest pressure of any six of those to make it to that blocking valve to then hold the blocking valves shut. Now I'll talk a, a bit about the slew pump shock relief valves. So this is the second part of the troubleshooting procedure. Um, each pump has a 400 bar shock relief valve for pressure spikes in that circuit. What you need is four of these relief valves spare, just keep them aside in a kit um, with the spools and internal springs removed. So when you replace them, you basically open center that pump and completely disable that circuit. So you'll need to do that on two different circuits and then the one circuit that it hasn't happened to is the one that you can effectively troubleshoot and it will be, it will be the only thing controlling that machine slew. Now I've just modified the schematic to include the 400 bar shock relief valves. Uh, you would then fit the four dummy valves to slew pump two and three to then test circuit one. And because we've fitted the slew blocking supply modification, the blocking valves will still work because pressure on this circuit will be the pressure that holds the blocking valves closed. In the normal configuration, there'll be no pressure in slew circuit two so nothing will, there'll be no pressure available to hold the blocking valves open so they won't work. So then you will have pressure leaking through and trying to, trying to steer your pumps and, and rotate your engine backwards. So some concerns you might imagine for this is that with no pressure available at these uh, pumps, they won't be able to produce pressure or suction. Um, that means if there is no charge pressure in those circuits, it doesn't matter because there's no suction there to create the cavitation. So there's one of the concerns that you might have there. Um, I never encountered any issues doing this and done it a bunch of times and yeah, it was excellent. You basically, you're doing a true test of that circuit doing uh, cycle time and the pressure and counter slewing. Um, and you're disabling the, the two uh, balance valves for that circuit as well, so they're neutralized. Now that you've done that, what are you looking for when you're doing single circuit testing? So you're, you do your cycle times, so once the machine's up at speed, record the time it takes to do one full lap on that one circuit. You should see 30 seconds on the correct amount of flow for those pumps. If it's a 60-60 pump, you'll see 43 seconds and that's 180 cc's turning that machine. Uh, you'll check your stall pressures, check it high and low idle in case there's uh, a leakage that's supplemented by the high idle. So if you drop that idle, you, the leakage might be a bit more apparent. Um, abnormalities, so look for pulsating hoses and unusual noise. Um, temperatures, see if you can use thermal imaging potentially. Uh, test in the same condition on all circuits if necessary. Um, and then maybe take some photos of, of different components that may help. Um, there's another test of case strain leakage. You don't need the slew blocking supply modification or, or any of the, uh, the dummy shock relief valves to do that. You can just do that testing stall left and right for your um, case strain leakage with a flow meter. Um, and basically you, you'll go through, if you suspect it's on the left hand side, you only really need to test uh, swing circuit one, two and three on the left hand side. If you have no idea, you basically have to check all six. So conduct this test six times. Remember, as you pull your shock relief valves out and put them back in, you basically need to bleed the pumps each time they come out because it will drop the case oil. So there are some tricks to do on that. So there's a few things that I've mentioned in this video previously that might make you wonder why is any of this worth it. So one of those things is the machine can actually still operate fine with a fault. Um, why do we, why bother with it? Well, the thing is uh, you will see reduced component life and particularly swing boxes is one of my big suspicions because we did see this a number of times. I'll play the video now, but you can see that this gearbox has lost drive. And I mentioned earlier about a loud whirring noise. It sounds like a jet engine in there. Um, basically you've got two pumps just going to one motor so that motor's basically doing double speed 
spinning that top planetary and that's that noise you're hearing it's doing twice the twice the rpm of what it typically would because it's stripped that drive and all, then all your pressure and flow gets lost through that 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 motor and we we encounter that a bunch of times so i'll talk a little bit more about so i had loosely linked the failures of swing gearboxes of that failure mode to having the wrong pumps installed on the slew circuit whereby that circuit would always be running at maximum pressure or higher which was not uncommon the whole time during slewing during acceleration during full speed slowing and counter slowing so it's running at maximum load all the time and that would that would diminish the life on that component and we would intermittently see failures on these gearboxes where on smaller models you just don't see them fail in that way so here's a photo of that spline this one hadn't failed this one was replaced out at just under 12,000 hours and it was well oh, days away from failing by the looks of that so that one hadn't but uh, there were many instances of gearboxes that had failed and that's that loud whirring noise or jet engine type noise you hear um, the machine will still slow because there's two other circuits to to control it that just because that one has lost drive it it doesn't lose slew altogether whereas if it was on a smaller model machine it would lose slew drive altogether but this is something unique to the 6090s and it it also could be related to the 6030s as well i have heard instances of it and that is also because another factor of the larger slew motors so they'll generate a slightly higher torque as well so it, it it correlates with that as well so that wraps up the 6090 slew system discussion today the key points i want you to take from this is that the 6090 slew system is actually three independent circuits it's a very robust system and well protected from complete loss of slew by component failure so it's it's very safe the only common components that really influence the function are the joystick proportional valves and the slew ring barring some other passive systems like um, charge and flushing uh, none of that really influences how it works um, but they're the only two main common things single circuit testing eliminates the interference or noise during troubleshooting so it's a lot easier to find where a problem might be with single circuit testing and i also strongly recommend to install the slew blocking supply modification before you have a problem um, we can help out with that just get in touch through the comments um, and we can we can guide you with that um, i'm going to leave uh, a pdf of this this uh, presentation in the description below and I'll also have some schematics for the slew system as well any questions by all means hit me up in the comments or linkedin or facebook um, i'm happy to hear it thanks for watching